I'm very excited to introduce you to the subject of today's interview, and that's Mike Miller. Mike is a patriot from Lancaster County, Pennsylvania, running for the state Senate. His opponent is a rhino with an abysmal voting record, and Mike is a proven patriot who was out on the streets after the 2020 election campaigning for election integrity and has been on the front lines against CRT and the grooming in our schools. So go to MikeMillerForSenate.com to learn more and support Mike and get him into the Pennsylvania Senate. Let's meet Mike now and let him tell you a bit more. All right, Mike, great to have you here and uh, you. chatting with us here and giving us some of your time. Um, real quick, for, especially for those who don't know you, give us a little bit of your origin story. How did you end up getting involved in politics and this rising patriot movement and the like? Yes. Well, I, I, I'd actually never run for public office before uh, running for Senate. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I guess like most, I, I watch the news, watch the national news. Yeah. Uh, I loved a political debate growing up. I grew up in a family that was, uh, had, had a good mix of the 60s generation, liberals at the house, and my parents were more on the conservative side. So good debate. I grew up with that but just never thought of running for office. Right. And then right. I think what really, what really prompted me to, to get more engaged and more concerned was, was when COVID arrived at the country and I saw just the strange response to that. Mm -hmm. And I really began to feel that it didn't seem like our elected officials are really listening to the people anymore and, and not out for our good. Right. It seemed pretty obvious at that right. point. Right, right. How did, how did Trump affect you in a way, especially when back in 2015 and, 2016 and the, and the the campaign. You know, I mean, he was talking like nobody else. He defeats 15 or 16 of yeah. the GOP's finest. Uh, you know that were, were bred for that moment. They're professional politicians, par excellence, yes. and he would slaughtered every single one of them. You know, yes. how, how did did that impact you at all in I, terms of? I can remember just feeling like I wanted to believe in him. Uh -huh. You know, I yeah. wanted to believe that he would carry out the his policies. Right. But again, he was not known as a conservative. I mean, he was right. a known quantity as a public figure. Right. He wasn't known as a conservative no, throughout his life. Wasn't. So he was espousing all of these strong conservative beliefs. And I wanted to believe that, but it was hard for me to believe that at 70 years old, he'd, you know, he'd suddenly arrived at right. all these positions and he was going to carry it through. Um, he was an entertainer and so forth. So I wanted to believe in him. Uh, but in the primary, I did support uh, Ted Cruz in the primary. Um, but when he beat everybody out, sanctification is progressive. <laughs> <laughs> but when he beat everybody out, um, right. you know, I, I supported him yeah. at that point, yeah. and I wanted to believe. And then, uh, sure enough, he, he he carried through on his policies. Yeah, he, he really sure did. did. Yeah. So um, I was glad to see that, and of course, the country really embraced a non-politician uh, uh, and the and the populist movement. I think was was what people had wanted for years. How, how do you feel about uh, what's going on here in the Keystone State in terms of the, the patriot populist movement that seems to be rising? I, I've visited several times uh, the, the organization Free PA, mm -hmm. and I've just been blown away at yeah. the uh, mobilization of just ordinary folks, particularly suburban, exurban folk who are getting mobilized, who are getting organized and ready to take this yes. state by storm. Very similar to what we saw with uh, Glenn Youngkin in, yes. in Virginia, the way he was able to mobilize the exurban rural vote. What, what's, what's your prospects here? I mean, obviously Pennsylvania has been blue uh, a little too often. 2016 it wasn't, but 2020 it went back to its old horrid ways of, of going blue, uh, granted uh, somewhat suspiciously, but uh, <laughs> we, we are on YouTube. Well, we, we have to be careful how we, we say blue. this. Hey, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> we, we, that's right. That's right. So what do you, what do you think about this uh, populist patriot uprising and its prospects yeah. for flipping Pennsylvania yeah, solid well, red? I, I think that's really the challenge before us is it's, I think you're seeing people really wake up. I think COVID yeah. and the shutdowns woke people up. Yeah. I think the election yeah. woke people up. And, and I think the establishment, or the swamp, as the president called it, I think they thought we would have, we would have gotten quiet by now, that mm -hmm. we would have gotten tired. And by the middle of 2021, we would have been done and things would have come back to normal. And that hasn't happened. Right. These, these groups have continued to grow and strengthen. And I think people have realized that you know, we, we as the private citizens that need to, you know, reprimand our government when they go, as, when they go astray, right, right. Um, that we, we, we're asleep at the wheel. Yeah. You know, that we did not, 
you know, we were not paying attention to the school boards. We were not paying attention to our elections. You know, you can't and get the precincts to, and yeah, the whole nine. Yeah, yards. we're not running for committees that right. we, we need to represent. You know, and we've gotten, frankly, we got we we focused on the family for a long time. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You know, and yep. there's nothing wrong with that. But I think when there's no balance, when no when families right. have no room for any civic affairs, right, right, I right. think that's where the Democrats and this progressive movement, they really infiltrated the power, uh, you know, the, the power uh, zones mm -hmm. of our government. Uh, yeah. And they did it at a local level, too. Yeah. And by the time we figured it out, um, you know, we were in pretty dire straits. Right. And right. so, but now I think you're seeing this wake up of, okay, I'm committed to, to take back the country. Right. But it's going to have to be a sustained effort. It takes time to undo what's been done. This yeah. happened over decades. Yeah, absolutely. What, what do you think of Doug Mastriano was talking about the notion of turning Pennsylvania into the Florida of the Northeast? I'm all for yeah, it. Yeah, for me, I mean, that's very exciting. <laughs> I grew up in Connecticut, you know, and while I, I like the weather in Florida, you know, I, I, I don't know, I didn't grow up around palm trees, you know, how do you have a Christmas palm tree? I, I like the <laughs> Northeast, I love being up here. Yeah. Um, do, what do you think of those prospects and what, what can, what role can local and state government uh, fulfill in order to provide that kind of vision for, for yeah. the, uh, you know, where we tend to be looking so much for answers in Washington, D.C., but it seems like some people like Ron DeSantis and others, they're, they're kind of stepping up to the place and saying, forget D.C., you know, we've got, we've got a sanctuary state here yes. where we can f fulfill our values. Do, yes. you, do you see that? How, what, how does state and local government fit into that kind yeah, of Well, I think what you see with Ron DeSantis that's really resonated is he's listened to the people. Right, I mean, right, right. I, I, people ask, you know, what's your platform? How about listening to the people right. for a change? I mean, right. instead of imposing your views on everybody and everybody's fearful that, you know, you're going you're, you're gonna to dominate and take over. That's what we've had a lot of in government the last couple of years is what I say is the, what mm -hmm. I say goes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, whereas he seems to be listening to what the people want. And, right. and um, that, I think that's step number one. I think the other step is, uh, you know, we have, we, we don't have three equal branches of government. Mm -hmm. We have three, we have a separation of powers, mm -hmm. but the legislative branch, we're a nation of laws. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, First and foremost, mm -hmm. we're not a nation of men. Mm -hmm. right. Somebody once said, we're, we're not a nation of men, we're a nation of laws. Right. And that's so important because the people's rights and freedoms are not protected by benevolent mm -hmm. dictators right. in, who do things in the name of health and safety. Right. They, right. They're, they're protected from, uh, from, evil dictators right. through laws that have been passed by the legislature, right. which are hard to overturn. Right, right. And so what we're seeing, I think what we need to see more of is people in government, in the legislative side, state locally, who are willing to stand for the laws that they wrote in the first place. Right, that's I right. I mean, because a lot of what we see happening yeah. right now is laws that are on the books have basically been thrown, just ignored, yeah. because yeah. we're in this strange age of, of a biomedical security state where right. because there's a virus out there, we don't necessarily treat uh, our laws the same way as we once did. Yeah. And that has to change. I mean, that, that's what's violating people's freedoms is they can't count on the rule of law anymore. Right. Well, that's because a, there's always that's... an excuse. Right, right. And uh, the whole notion of technocracies, you know, the yeah. technocracies require some class of experts to rule it that are above uh, yes. what they're ruling, basically. Yes, yeah. and yeah. the legislatures aren't smart enough to, to, to know how to handle that, so right. we'll just skip, skip right. whatever we'll they skip that process and just, <laughs> so, right, sign executive orders and yeah. the like, exactly. So, uh, you know, we have lots of people watching from all different walks of life. Um, how, can they, uh, how can they follow in your patriot footsteps here. Some may want to run for office, but others may not be. You know, we're dealing with moms, kids, mm -hmm. homeschooling. What, what can everybody do, as it were, uh, to make a difference and an impact like you're doing? Yeah, well, I understand not everybody is up for running for office. It's a, it's a big commitment. It's a big step. Uh, but I think everybody has to decide you know, I, I, my, my line has been, what lane can you, you got to pick, choose a lane to stay in. Right, right. Uh, and be effective in that lane. So if, if it's running for office, you know, there's, there's one lane. If it's supporting a candidate who's running for office, what skills could you maybe bring to a grassroots candidate right. who you believe in, you think he'll defend your values? Or, you know, do you have clerical skills? Do you have technology skills? Do you right. have marketing skills? That's what awesome. could you bring 
uh, to that. Do you have, do you have finances? That, that helps a little bit too. Um, <laughs> so, you know, I think, uh, and the other, the other big aspect of it is, uh, and I know this is not my idea, but you've heard a lot of it lately, is running for these committee positions. Yeah, yeah. Um, people have to engage, and there's not a whole lot of work there. Right. Um, to just step up, and, and right. but they're very influential. When those yeah. committee positions are influential because they are endorsing candidates, which I'm not a fan of that, but they, right. they're very influential in that endorsement. Right. I don't know if you heard Rachel Levine just got Woman of the Year. Um, how does uh, Rachel Levine, this, I think, what first transgender person to get put into some high post? She, uh, she, Rachel Levine was here uh, in the administration Harrisburg in yes. Pennsylvania, right? Yes. How does Rachel Levine connect with your uh, opponent that you're running against. Well, I, would, I guess I would say she was a big inspiration for me to run uh, <laughs> because she was the author of the shutdowns in Pennsylvania that, throughout right. 2020. Yeah. 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 Um, when, when, when the governor had ordered and, the, and, and she or he had yeah. ordered a lot of the shutdowns, they were on television every day right. explaining why we had to shut down the entire economy to protect our most vulnerable. Um, she was also the one that uh, allowed a lot of deaths to occur in nursing homes throughout Pennsylvania. Not was, for her family, though. Right, not right, for her right, family. No, yeah, right, right. So um, a lot of that was an inspiration for, for me to run and just feel like government is really out of control. And later I learned when I began the campaign and I started to research you know, the, the, the incumbent that I'm running against, that he actually confirmed Tom Wolf's nomination, our governor, uh, he, he confirmed her nomination uh, for Secretary of Health. Wow. And that was in 2018. He had also done it in 2015 when she became Physician General wow. of Pennsylvania. So um, I just thought that's a profound misjudgment. Absolutely. For her to. <laughs> that's a really confirm. nice way of putting it. A, a profound radical, misjudgment. Yeah, a profound yeah. misjudgment. Yeah. And, it, and it cost our state dearly. I mean, it's yeah. really sad yeah. to me yeah. the number of businesses that were shut down in Pennsylvania, obviously unnecessarily right. because of her actions. Right, well, you know, wish you all the best, love what you're doing, and, uh, thank you. and we'll be watching closely and keeping up with things. So Mike Miller, thank you so much. Thank Mike. you very much. Thank you.